U.S. wants me to do this. Okay. <laughs> Did you see how long he held that in his hand? <laughs> Taking it back. You know? Philippians chapter 2 is where we're opening our Bibles to first this morning. Thank you for those really kind, gracious words. At Berean Bible Institute, we do online classes. We call them virtual instructor-led classes. Why? Because we love to put lots of words and confuse you with things, right? Virtual instructor-led classes. What does that mean? Well, you have a virtual classroom. That means you're going to log in, and we're, we're going to have a Zoom meeting. We're going to talk together. We're going to see faces. We're going to pray. We're going to laugh. We're going to talk, all right? Next best thing to us being face-to-face -face with that. And then uh, instructor-led, that means you're, you're not just studying on your own, you're not just reading a book, you're actually walking alongside. And I'm pretty certain that's the Pauline example of someone coming alongside and teaching you and working with you. So uh, wonderful, praise the Lord with that. We have been piloting some, some different things where we call it a, uh, we don't call it, the, the educational world calls it. Who's ever heard of a flipped classroom? That's what happens, yeah, an educator over here. That's, uh, that's when the kids revolt against the teacher in the class, right? A flipped classroom, no. A flipped classroom is this, you come into class being prepared for class. You've watched all the lecture material, you've done all this stuff, so you walk in and you're ready to engage and you're ready to learn. So in that spirit, did everybody get the session materials that I sent out last night in the email? Everyone's prepared, right? All right, I guess not. Someone raised their hand, a BBI student. No, um, I'm just picking with you on that. But you do need a couple things today. Who uh, does not have an outline? If you don't, raise your hand, and one of our amazing ushers will be able to help you with that. You'll need your Bible, as Pastor uh, Richie also pointed out. You know what would be really helpful is a BBI bookmark because we're gonna be turning around in a lot of scripture uh, this morning. The most important thing you need for today's session, how many of you here, again, are married in this session? All right. The most important thing you need in this session is a stick. I happen to find a drumstick. There's a couple up here, so if you forgot yours, if you didn't do the message, you need a big stick. Why? Because as I talk about husbands, wives can go, <clears throat> <laughs> When I talk about wives, husbands can go, hmm. <laughs> and you know what the kids are gonna do? Hmm. <laughs> do we use God's word like a stick? Like a jabbing, jousting tool to inflict pain and ha harm and damage on one another? As not how the Apostle Paul used the, God of word, the word of God. He used the word of God. Yes, it convicts us, and conviction hurts, but we're gonna open God's word together this morning, and we're gonna allow the Lord Jesus Christ to produce himself in us more, and it might jab a little, but let's see what the Lord has for us in terms of marriage this morning. Uh, with that in mind, we'll put our sticks away, and let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for my brothers and sisters here. Lord, we love you. We are so thankful for Jesus Christ, for the life we have, the sinless life, the sacrificial uh, example, and just uh, all he afforded us through the cross. Father, we are unworthy. Father, thank you for the blessing of understanding your grace. Father, thank you for the, the faithful generations who have, who have led us here and, and kept the message of your grace, the dispensations, the mystery, Father, who have faithfully taught that. So, Father, we, we've learned these things. But, Father, as we're here today, help us take these things and, and write deep within our hearts the so what. What, is, what do these things look like in our lives daily when it comes to being husbands and wives, Father, as we're looking at that. Father, you have wonderful plans for our marriages. Help us to see the beauty of your plans. Help us to live according to them this morning. Father, encourage us, equip us through your word. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, in addition to those tools that I've shared with you this morning, there are two essential elements that we need to have when it comes to discussing marriage together. I am a pastor, 
these two things alliterate. That's how it works. The first thing, uh, I'm reminded, I'll, I'll share it with you uh, via a story. When I was in Bible school, uh, you take every opportunity you can get to serve the Lord. You, they really bring in that, that idea of preach, pray, sing, or die at any moment. And I haven't died yet, but I've had lots of opportunities to preach, pray, and do some other things. And times I sing too. So with all of that, uh, my wife and I, early in our marriage, we had the opportunity one summer to travel down uh, to Midwest Grace Fellowship. Anyone ever familiar with that? So we had the opportunity to travel, I think it's in Missouri is where they were having it at that point. You're going to find out really quickly from this story that I'm not good with geography. So... But we uh, drove down, and, and Candace and I led the, the children's ministry all week long, and it was an awesome week. We studied Paul's traveling companions, uh, his yoke fellows in ministry, and we learned what is a biblical friend. It's a great, great time together with that. And uh, we actually had to leave a little bit early because my wife was starting a new job, uh, and it was really exciting. So we needed to get back in time for her to start this new job. So we head out, and man, I was just spent. I had been given my heart, pouring into those kids. I mean, I just had a great time. Any minister of the word knows when you're done giving it out, somebody asked me after the, the, the message yesterday, how are you feeling? I'm like, I'm energized right now. Talk to me after I eat lasagna and bread and carbs and the, 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 the glow of just preaching. I'm going to be tired. So I was tired after this week of ministry. And so uh, my wife, she's amazing. She's a servant. She said, you know what? Let me help you. I'm going to drive. You, you just sleep in the car. So I slept. And she drove until she couldn't drive anymore. She gently wakes me up. Justin, Justin, I, I'm going to fall asleep. If, can you drive now? We're, doing, we're making great time. Wonderful. We're almost up to the next major highway up here. Just get on the highway and, and go. No more turns after that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I didn't need to consult a map. I trust my wife. And I thought I understood her instructions. <laughs> so she falls asleep and I get on and I got on the next major highway. And so we're driving along and hours later, she wakes up. And mind you, we lived in Wisconsin, so Missouri, I'm, I'll mirror it, Wisconsin here, Missouri here, all right? So we were driving up, and we were supposed to be going over there, back home. You know, the new job, money payments coming into our family? So we were heading over there. Yeah, east, that's what it's called. So we were heading over east to go to that, and uh, I got on the highway, and she wakes up. Where, you know, how are we doing? Great, honey. We are awesome. We're almost to uh, Council Bluffs. Anybody know where that's at? That way. I got on the wrong road. Well, no, it was the right road. I went the wrong direction on that road. But God is good. A, her employer knew me because I worked for them before, so she just had to say, but Justin, and they got it. <laughs> but God is good. We were able to go a little bit further, and her grandmother, who is now with the Lord, we were able to uh, spend a day or two with her, and actually her dad happened to be just traveling on his bike, and so we got to see him and, and her grandmother, one of the most precious times that the Lord and his providence allowed, even in my mistake, praise the Lord, with all of that. But you know what I needed in that circumstance? A map. <laughs> I needed to use the map correctly. Hmm, that sure sounds like something we might understand. What is our map in life? Our map is the word of God. And we need to read our map correctly. That is where the principle, the idea of right division, un understanding what is God doing today? What is he not doing today? These are the things that bring clarity, that bring freedom. We've all tasted that freedom with all of that. These are the things that keep us secure in Christ. And so we're so thankful for that. The first thing that we need when we're starting to talk about marriage together because this is a real thing. In marriage, have we ever poked one another? Is it hard? Marriage is challenging. They don't say that at the, at the, the ceremony. 
They, they say for better or worse. They don't say through stinky and stinkier. <laughs> Marriage is hard. We need a map. Otherwise, we're gonna get stuck in the weeds and we're gonna get stuck looking down and we're gonna get lost and we're not gonna know how to get out of the mess that we find ourselves in. We need that map for us is the word of God and the word of God alone. The second thing that we need is, I'm gonna call it this, we need a mindset. We need a way that we're going to approach, a disposition that we're going to approach marriage and what we're gonna learn from God's word about that. Uh, another way we could say is we just need a little bit of humility. That's what we need. But a mindset of this, and it's, it's a specific mindset. I had to do some leadership training. I was in uh, management in a hospital. I got to do all kinds of fun, different leadership trainings. And we're at one, and man, they treated us well. The food was always really good at these things. And they brought in an improvisational comedian. I mean, that's, that's usually the role I serve at meetings. No. But they brought in an improvisational comedian. And we had to work with our teams. And this comedian taught us, he said, you have one challenge. Uh, he gave us a prompt. And in our team, so my whole leadership team was with me, uh, he, he gave us this challenge. He said, you know, you're starting, you're on a beach, and you have nothing, and you need to get from the beach to the finish line over here. And we were given one instruction. We could each only say one thing at a time. And we had to start what we were saying with the words, yes, and... What, he, what, what it ended up being is we might start on the beach and, and the first person would have to say, well, yes, and then I took off my flip-flop. And the next person would go, yes, and I took off my flip-flop and I threw it at them, or and, you know, they, they just went, whatever it went. And the, the, the craziness of this, you're thinking of like, what, you got paid to do this? This is the problem with healthcare right? This is, this is what's going on. The issue is this. That speaker knew those, the, the executive leadership, they knew something that I'm very thankful that I was taught in Bible school, actually. This is a principle that's taught all over the place. It's something called the principle of first mention. Have you ever heard of that before? And what is that? The first time that we tend to hear something, we respond that's too positive a term. We react, all right? Responding, I can be intentional with it, but I react. If you poke me with a stick, I'm gonna react. We react negatively when we hear something for the first time. Think of the gospel. What are the current statistics? Uh, okay, I'm gonna go old. What are the old statistics? I don't know what they are currently. How many times does somebody have to hear the gospel before they can they trust Christ? You know the... Uh, the six, seven is what I know, I see 10. I wouldn't be surprised if it's, if it's gone up because of the postmodern society that we're living in, that we're just building those foundations uh, like uh, Pastor Richie had told us. We have to hear these things multiple times. And I know in my leadership team, there were so many times where I would say something and, well, that would never work. That's stupid, oh my goodness, no. And, and we shut these ideas down before we ever do it and it blocked creativity and it kept us bound right where we were, right in the same mess that we started in. We never made it further than that. But you know what we did? We were experts at chasing our tails. We were experts at going round and round, but we didn't just go round and round. There's pushing and pulling because you're trying to figure and you're just reacting negatively with one another. So this idea of a yes and mindset is really helpful. You know, we do this uh, theologically sometimes. We, we build these false walls that don't really exist. In the world of logic, they call them false dichotomies, where we set up these, these, these paper walls that don't really exist of, well, God is holy. God, God is righteous. God is, God is perfect and just and right and pure in all he does. Is that true? have somebody over here maybe leaning on the left side. I don't know if I'm on the left or right over here. But they're, oh, no, 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 no. God is loving. 
God is kind, God is gracious, and we set up these walls that don't really exist, that it has to be this or that. When in reality, scripture teaches in all humility when we look at God's word, yes, God is holy, God is righteous, yes, and God is loving, God is merciful, God is kind. He is both of these things at the same time. Why is that important? Because in marriage, we put up walls between ourselves and our spouses sometimes. It's easy for us to say, I know what God wants me to do. Yes, I'm supposed to lead my wife, but have you met her? And it's easy for a wife to say, yeah, I I would submit uh, if my husband were a little more like Christ. It's easy for us to put these things up when in reality we're both responsible for God's instructions to us individually. We're both responsible. It's yes, I lead with the love of Jesus Christ. And yes, my wife submits and she helps and she encourages in the love of Jesus Christ. It's both of these things. It's a yes and mindset with all of this. I had us go to Philippians chapter two and let's look at that because Jesus Christ is the ultimate example of yes and, not yes but. If I were tasked with what Jesus Christ was tasked with, I want you to take on flesh. You've been free, you've lived in perfect harmony and fellowship with me and the Godhead for all eternity. But I want you to go put on a, a, a tent of flesh. Really? You want me to wear that? I'd be like, you put a piece of spandex up here. I'm like, you want me to wear that? I wouldn't want to do it. He took it and he willingly, he put it on himself. And let's look at this, <laughs> yes, Father, mindset that Jesus Christ had, that he lived in obedience to the Father, the Father's will, and he enacted it because this is the ultimate yes and mindset. Oh my goodness, this, this is marriage right here. Philippians chapter two, verse three. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. I'm out, right? Nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. See, it's others. You're either talking about plural marriage or you're talking about, this is talking about the church. This isn't talking about my home. What did we talk about yesterday? First commandment was, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Then what do you say? The second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Paul says later on in the book of Romans, he says, love is the fulfillment of the law. But, he, but here, we're looking at this and we see that we love our wives. The others starts with other, meaning our spouse first. Look out and esteem them better than yourself. Look at verse four. Uh, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Verse five. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, did not consider it to be robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Marriage won't kill you unless you're a Netflix documentary. It shouldn't kill you. But you know what marriage will do? Marriage will put you in the perfect science classroom laboratory and create the perfect circumstances for you to learn to die to yourself, 
to die to your own interests so that Jesus Christ in his will above all else would be formed in you and you would seek to meet the needs of that person that you've committed your life to, to say, yes, I will. Yes, I do. With these things, we have our outline this morning, and I'd like us to walk through some, some principles, some ideas from the Word of God uh, that will help us find our way on the map. All right, so if we have point number one, we're gonna see here that, uh, you know, we're gonna answer the question first of why marriage. And God has some amazing reasons for marriage. So point number one, God's reasons for marriage include this. Uh, We were in the book of Philippians, so turn over to the book of Ephesians with me. Ephesians chapter 5. And this is going to be one of those places where a bookmark is going to come in handy because we will have to move around a little bit to get a really good theology of the home. We're all over the place. We're going to be from the Old Testament, from the very beginnings, to how Paul builds on that. And he, he takes that, and, and it reaches its zenith whenever Christ came on the scene. We have the glories of marriage today and the dispensation of grace in a way that marriage could not have been dealt with and handled because we have the very spirit of God indwelling in us and we have a capability and a power to love and serve others in a way that was never possible in time past. We've got a high calling when it comes to the home in the dispensation of grace. Ephesians chapter five, verse 31, Paul is quoting from the Old Testament, right from the very, the book of the beginnings. In verse 31, he says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become, what? One flesh. God's reasons for marriage include this, the union of husband and wife. The union of husband and wife. The goal of marriage, the, God's goal and intent for marriage is a union, is one. And I like to phrase it this way. If, if we go back to the idea of setting targets and challenges, all those things from yesterday, we start over here. And if I have a finish line, do you know what's waiting at the finish line of marriage? The thing that I am always in constant pursuit of, what am I after? We're after unity, oneness, unity. The two become one. This starts to make my mind just boggle when we see that. And it should make your mind boggle a little bit because this union of two becoming one is a very reflection of the image of God himself. On your outlines, the union of a husband and wife as a reflection of God's image. When God created the institution of marriage, he said, you know what? I am going to leave a Polaroid of myself on this world. So when people look at this thing called marriage where there's two people coming together and living in harmony, living in union and a bond and service and all of these things together, they're gonna look at that and say, hmm, all right, they're going to make the connection that we are a picture of God himself into the world in his image. Well, what ways is that? Well, let's first, before we get too far, keep, your, keep a bookmark in Ephesians chapter 5, because like I said, we'll be back later on. But I do want to look to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. Genesis chapter 1. And verse 26. So we're looking at the idea that this unity is a picture of God's image. The first thing that we really want to point out here quickly is that the Trinity itself is uh, the, the union of two things, multiple things coming together as one is a picture of God's image just by means of the Trinity himself. All right, we're becoming one, but the Trinity 
is three becoming one. Where do we see this? Well, we often, when we're teaching in basic Bible doctrines, we want to talk about, well, show me the Trinity. Where do I see it? We see it from the very beginning right here in Genesis chapter one, verse 26. One of the first passages that we're going to turn to to help us see the plurality, the Trinity of God. Verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. God created man because God himself, uh, to reflect his unity in one. Uh, we won't look at it now for time's sake, but mark this well on your outline, Deuteronomy chapter six. We are going to be there tomorrow. We could have gone there every day this week because it is such a key passage. Anybody know what, what Deuteronomy chapter six is often called, particularly like in an Orthodox Jewish home? They call it the Shema. All right, what does that mean, Shema? It, it's actually the first word in Hebrew of, of the prayer. It's Shema Yisrael, hear Israel. Interesting enough, in, in uh, the, the Hebrew thought more than the, uh, the American thought, because we, we look at scripture through American eyes. If I hear something in one ear out the other, that's kind of what we're thinking about uh, hearing sometimes. Biblical hearing, Old Testament Hebrew hearing, is hearing, taking it in, and obeying. There's a swift instruction and implication of obedience built into that. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. The Lord your God is one. When multiple things come together in union as one, it is a picture and it is a stamp of God in the world of that, of, of the God himself. <clears throat> Furthermore, it is a picture of God's character as well. Uh, we can see, uh, look with me in 1 Thessalonians chapter one. There is a misprint on your typo. Uh, we were talking about that whole I'm not perfect thing. It's a documentation of that, as uh, Pastor Richie said. So on your outlines, it's actually 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we'll begin in verse 7. Not only as we're showing the image of God to the world, we're, we're showing the Trinity, but we're showing what is God like. Because here's the thing. God created men to be men. Just like he, in creation, he created fish after their own kind. And he created birds after their own kind. And then he created man, all right? And then he, it's not just he created mankind, he gets specific, doesn't he? He talks that he created male, and then he created female, male and female, he created them. I love, it's like, how many times are we gonna say this? He says it multiple ways in lots of different ways. Why? Because it takes both the image of God stamped in the male, and it takes the image of God uniquely stamped through a woman, and it takes both of those things coming together to give you a whole picture of who God is. If I had a room here full of men, it would not be a complete picture of who God is. And if I had a room here of only women, it would be a beautiful picture, but it would not be a complete picture of God. It takes a man and woman in union as a complete picture of who God is. Well, what do you mean by that? He didn't create us different. Anything she can do or anything he can do, I can do better, right? 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7, God speaks a little bit to the gifts of grace that each gender, each uh, part of the marriage relationship that they hold. Verse seven says, but we were gentle among you just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become dear to us. I'm willing to die for you. Hey, do I have any mama bears here this morning? Yeah, mama bears, mama bears willing to die 
her cubs. And the Apostle Paul taps into that and he says, and when he gives the illustration of a nursing, cherishing mother, there's something tender, there's something protective that's God created to be manifested in evidence to the world uniquely through a woman. That's why he's pointing it out to the body of Christ. Well, he goes on and look at very uh, later on, Verse 10, your witnesses and God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. As you know, how we exhorted, comforted, and charged every one of you as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Then he not only talks about the tenderness and the cherish and the protective element of the woman, he brings out the strength that a man brings in as a father. And he says, we exhorted you. We comforted you. That comfort, we came alongside you. We gave you what we need. We poured into you as a father does his child. The union of husband and wife is a reflection of God's image. In one sense, the Trinity itself. In another sense, demonstrating the character and the nature of God both aspects. It's a, yes, he is strong. He is mighty, the God of heaven and earth. But he is also the God of mercies, the God who is faithful. He is both of these things. It's a yes and, and it takes us both to be able to paint the picture of who God is. That is why that is the picture of biblical marriage, and that is why it is so important for us to extol and, and show from God's word. I mean, marriage, the, uh, our country can vote whatever it wants to say what marriage is, but God's word says, I've given you a tool, I've given you a map to show them what I am like. I've given you a living illustration of what it looks like to be mine, and it's lived out moment by moment in the marriage relationship. Second thing, uh, second reason for marriage, it's the, uh, with the union, it shows God's image. Secondly, it shows, and it's a living demonstration of God's relationship with his church, the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter five, verse 32. Ephesians chapter five, we maybe had a bookmark there. Ephesians chapter five, verse 32. Well, we just read in verse 50, uh, 31 that the, the goal of marriage is unity, that, that pursuit of that. Why? Because it's a picture of God to the world. But wait, there's more. Verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Your marriage has huge implications for the world. You didn't think you were that important, did you? What God is doing in your home has an impact in your church and what other people see because it is that visible uh, demonstration. And we're gonna see as it gets into the responsibilities and the roles and the ways that God uses men and women differently within the home, it is constantly a picture of how Christ loved the church and he provides for her and he protects for her and the church responds in submission and the church responds uh, in love towards him. It's that picture and it's a living illustration of the gospel day in and day out. What's the old saying? Preach the gospel always, everywhere. Use words when necessary. We really have the opportunity to put that to practice in terms of our marriage, where we get to picture Christ and the church. So that's the first reason for marriage. The second reason for that, for marriage, is also the idea of communion. So union, we're, unity is we're always pushing forward. Second thing is communion of husband and wife. And we need to, to catch, uh, capture this idea as well. And to do so, we go back to Genesis chapter two. And 
And this is where we already saw some of the differences that God made between men and women, male and female, created he them. But why? Why does it take creating a male and a female with this? Why was this important? <clears throat> we'll see here with the communion of a husband and wife that men and women have an expressed need for number one, companionship. Where do we get that from? Genesis chapter two, verse 18. This is in the Garden of Eden. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. Now, isn't it interesting? The main words that we have heard God speak up to this point. The very first words, let there be Fill in the blank. Let there be light. And there was light. Those are the words of God. Let there be light. And then after he created it, what does he say? It's good. But here we see God saying something is not good. What is that? It is not good. Um, uh, it is not good that man should be alone. God created, God instituted the very first social relationship in this world for companionship between him. And that is a picture of God himself. Again, just when we're getting into the reasons of why, it just pictures him because God does not live alone. He lives in eternal, perfect fellowship as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I don't understand it, but I see it in God's word and I accept it. And I have little mini aneurysms when I try to think about it. It is not good for man to be alone. <clears throat> Nor, uh, it, uh, furthermore, uh, God instituted marriage uh, for companionship. He also has given us uh, marriage as a partnership. As a partnership. Look with me in verse four and five of chapter two. Verse four says this, this is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And before any plant of the field was in the earth and before any herb of the field had grown, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth and there was no man to what? Till the ground. God created, God is in instilled within men to work, to do something. In fact, in all of mankind, we're created to do something. And he said, there was no man to till the ground. And then we move forward. Go with me up to verse 15. <clears throat> then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to do what? Tend and keep it. He gave him something to do. All right, and then we get into later on in that passage where we all, uh, where we go into verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. So he did something about it. Adam has a job to do, but it's not good. He can't do it alone. Why? What's he need? He needs a hamburger helper, right? I was looking back through, I pulled out some old resources from when my wife and I first, we were, we were dating at the time and we, we took the marriage class or a marriage class at school and I was looking through the notes and uh, as we were learning about all of these things, I saw a little love note that I had written on her folder and you know, do you know what it said? You're my hamburger helper. Aww. <laughs> and... Uh, I think Kevin appreciated that. No, no. <laughs> Verse 19, and out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called them, each living creature, that was its name. And so he names everything. And look at, verse tw at the end of verse 20. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. Can you imagine the scene that is taking place? I mean, he's in beautiful glory and, he, and there's, he's in innocence and there's no sin in this world, but he's looking at all these animals and he's like, hmm, 
something's not adding up here. Something is, is not adding up. There's nothing for me. Verse 21, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, in the words of William Shakespeare, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called, whoa, man, because she was taken out of Man, isn't that poetical? I mean, girls, are you swooning weak in the knees when you hear that? <laughs> he was missing something. It wasn't good. God saw the need and he fixed it. He gave him a helper comparable to him. And what happens at this point after the crowning of creation, after man and woman have been created now, it's good, right? It's very good. It took both Adam and Eve, both a man, both a woman to be created. These are the underpinnings of a marriage. We have to recognize, we have to see why, because this matters, because it's what we're showing the world of our good God. We love the grace of God, and we want everybody to enjoy it. We are a vehicle of the grace of God when we express the man that God created us to be, and when we express and we live out, according to God's word, the woman that God created us to be. There was a little Sunday school boy, uh, a woman teaching a uh, Sunday school class and how God created everything, cutie human, uh, human beings and one of the little kids in the class, he was really intent whenever that teacher was talking about how Adam made Eve to, or God made Adam to fall asleep and take the rib from her, uh, from his side. And later on in the week, the mom looked at him and he, this little kid is just laying down. He just, he doesn't really look like himself at all. Like, like he, was, he was sick. And mom looks at the kid, she goes, honey, what's, what's wrong? What's the matter? And the little boy is just holding his stomach and he goes, mom, I don't, I don't feel well. I think I'm having a wife. <laughs> Two zero. No, no. <laughs> God created us as male and female uh, for communion with him, communion as one, and for the mutual partnership and companionship of that. Now, as the two do come together, God has given each couple some responsibilities. That's number two on your outline. God's responsibilities for the couple in marriage include this. So God institutes this social relationship, the first family relationship. Notice there's a mom and dad before there are kids here. That is the best God-designed plan for us. But with that, <clears throat> he gives pretty quick instructions after he creates this, uh, this institution. And look in verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. We already established the one flesh thing. What we're looking at here is as a couple comes together and we create a new marriage relationship, two things need to happen. Two responsibilities that each and every couple, man and woman together as one, they're responsible to do these two things. Number one, leave parental authority. It is essential for God's plan to work that a man and a woman leave their father and mother. Why? Because that husband is going to be tasked, spoiler alert, that husband is going to be tasked with the charge of leading his home. You can't lead if someone else is leading. And you can't lead until you've left. 
Step number one is leaving parental authority. The biblical definition here of, of leaving carries with it imagery of loosening. All right, taking a knot and loosening it a little bit. All right, loosen, depart, go away. At times, it's even described as abandoning. That's not God's plan, not, not abandoning, but a departing, a going, a separating away. Leaving is not in the way that we traditionally think of forsaking somebody, turning your back on. It's stepping aside, stepping towards God's plan. It's following the path that God has laid out. That's, that's what we're talking about with all of this. And when this happens, when leaving occurs, your love does not lessen or leave for your parents, does it? What does it usually do? It, 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 your love for your parents oftentimes grows because when you get married, you're walking in and all of a sudden adulting, that's a verb, adulting takes a whole new Meaning, doesn't it? All the things, the responsibilities, the stresses, the hard things, the struggles, all of those things. Well, you mean mom and dad, you mean you've been doing this all these years? Why didn't you ever tell me? The goal of leaving is to establish independence from parents and a separate household and entity. It's always done in an honoring manner. Ephesians 6, 2 still applies that we honor our father and our mother. But it is done with an awareness of dependence or over-dependence upon our parents. When we leave, we leave physically particularly in the early stages of marriage when we're setting expectations and we're figuring out what's normal what does this look like? How do we engage? We need to be on our own physically. Every couple needs to leave physically. This one's hard. I hope you don't have steel-toed shoes on. We have to leave financially. Live within your means, not mom and dad's means. They've had a lot of time to amass a lack of wealth. You've, you've had a lot less time. Why? Why do we need to struggle financially? Because we need to struggle, period. We need to struggle together. God uses these hard things. My goodness, there's, in the canon of my wife and I's life, we have so, our favorite memories of our life are the first few, few years of our marriage when we had nothing. And one of our greatest delicacies was something called fish stick casserole <laughs> that came from something we lovingly refer to as the eternal bag of fish sticks that we could not get rid of forever. That struggle made us who we are. Along the way, you also, when you struggle, leaving financially and leaving gives you the opportunity to not just struggle together, but you can be victorious together. Praise God, we need to leave our homes. If I think of some of the, the, the greatest advice that, that was given to me, it was leave. Why? Because this was foreign to me. I didn't know this. You know, uh, you, you look at what a, a, a television tells you a marriage is, you see a stupid guy as a husband, like, I don't know what's going on. Did I do that? You know, uh, and then you have the wife who's domineering and, and mean. And then even more so, what's the other token character in every family sitcom? The overbearing in-laws, right? That's not God's pattern. Let's get our instructions from the book, not from TV. This encouragement was, uh, was amazing. Another place we need to make certain we leave is emotionally. <clears throat> this is a hard one. Where? To whom do you turn 
when tension arises in life, but I'll phrase it this way. Who are you going to turn to when tension arises with your spouse? Answer the question with me. We set up a target and we set a, a, a finish line over here, didn't we? What's the target? What's the reason? What's the finish line we're shooting for in marriage? Unity. Unity. So it stands to reason, who am I going to turn to when things turn tense with my spouse? I'm gonna to turn to my wife and she's going to turn to me. That is God's plan. This is a responsibility of the couple. You know what I'm also gonna say? It's a resource. You invest in these things, you do these things, and it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's just gonna help you. It's like self-healing something. I don't know, it, it, it just, it helps you grow through it because God's way works. Is it gonna be easy? No. no. <clears throat> but it works. God's responsibility for the couple includes a, a marriage that we leave parental authority. Number two, we cleave to one another. My brother-in-law, Travis, is a meat cutter. And I think of him every time I read God's instruction to cleave, right? Because what's a, what's a cleaver? This, in, in the, it, it's either uh, a character in a TV show from the 50s, right? A cleaver. Three, well, that, that, that didn't count. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's either that or what is it? It's a big old knife and whoop. It's how we rightly divide our supper, right? With a cleaver. We use that. Is that what biblical cleaving is? Is it a weapon? No, biblically defined cleaving means the exact opposite of what our modern English says. It's, it means to cling. It actually has the idea and picturing of making inroads into something. To pursue or chase after. To be joined together to keep fast. And the problem is, is marriage in our world has kind of become a little bit like a post-it note marriage. Do we all know what post-it notes are? It's yeah, it's temporary. It's te they're, if it's temporary, it's not meant to last, right? You know what else it is? When I'm done, it, it's good for a season. It's disposable. I can get rid of this. Christ said in his earthly ministry, what God has joined as one, let no man tear asunder. And here's the, the, the picture, and this is why post-it notes are wonderful, is that I, do, I don't want a post-it note marriage because it's so easily, it's, no hard, it, it's not hard to separate at all. You know what a lot of people are looking to keep them glued and cleaved together? I'll tell you what the world tells you is gonna keep you glued and together. They're gonna say it's their physical relationship with one another. At best, it offers the adhesion of a post-it note. It's temporary and it's disposable and that's how the world treats it. That's the lies of Satan that he's used for that. But God gives us a biblical picture of what cleaving looks like. And it's not just a post-it note. It is taking a man and it is taking a woman and it is super gluing it together. Have you ever taken two pieces of paper where you were to glue this one and you were to glue this one together and you fuse it together? What happens when you were to try to separate those pieces of paper after they've been glued together? Yeah. There's going to be pieces. I'll just show, I'll just try this right here. I got a boy and a girl right here. All right, I'm going to glue these guys together. All right, there there is one. Now we're going to tear it apart. There's going to be pieces of pink. There's going to be pieces of her all over this guy left here, and there's going to be pieces of him all left here. And you know what else is going to be present? Holes. I ripped pieces of paper apart and it rips, it hurts. 
I haven't been through a divorce and I'm not trying to make light of it. These are very painful things. I grew up as a child of divorce and I saw the pieces of blue left on the pink of my mom. I saw the holes clean through the pain, the devastation that it causes. <clears throat> I assure you that God's grace meets us in these hard things. He equips us for those areas, for things, these times that have happened. But for those of us that are in a marriage right now, God has equipped us. God has given us the tools to be able to cleave to one another. Henry Smith, who was a Puritan preacher of the late 1500s, stated this, first a man must choose his love, then he must love his choice. That's biblical marriage. I said I do. I said I will. For richer, for poorer. Turns out the for poorer is far more consistent. In sickness and in health, no joke, We're, we live in, in sickness. That's where our world is. For better or worse, I tell you, there's a whole lot of days that sure feels like we're, we're camping and worse. But I committed and I turn towards her and I super glue myself towards her. That only happened because A, we left together and B, we pursue one another with that end game. We want to be one. Why? Because we want to show Jesus Christ to the world. We want to show the world what it looks like when, when multiple things live in harmony together and we demonstrate what Jesus Christ did on our behalf. We want to be a living gospel through our marriage. This is a challenging one, guys, because when we get into marriage, there's just so many things to talk about. Obviously, you can see, we've not made it even halfway through the outline. The answers will be in the back for you. There, it says answers, and the, the answers are written in red on it. But the idea, the things that are left for us to talk about are the roles for us individually, uh, number three, God's roles for men and women in marriage necessitate that A, husbands lead their homes. That is God's given role for the man is that we step up, men, and we lead. We take the charge with that. And correspondingly, just like in a great dance of life, Christ, the head of the church, leads and the church follows after Likewise, the husband leads, and what does the wife do? She follows, she submits. That in conjunction with the fact that she was created to be Adam's helper. Outside of the marriage relationship in scripture, do you know where the word helper is primarily used of? What it's referring to? It's referring to God himself in the form of the Holy Spirit. Look with me, and or don't look with me, we don't have time. But John chapter 14, you all the references should be on your paper. If not, talk to me and I'll give them to you. But John chapter 14, 15, 16, even in the book of 1 John, we have the advocate, we have the helper. Christ said, I am going away, but I will send a helper to you. And he defines helper himself. My spirit is what he says with all of that. Women, what a privilege to take that role and to have that supportive role just as the spirit of God energizes and equips us. My wife is faithfully at my side, energizing and equipping and serving me so that I can lead our home and as God allows and God blesses me with opportunity and influence to lead others as well. These are God's roles. He's also given us responsibilities. I do not lead as a dictator. I lead in love. And that is what God calls us to. Why do I lead in love? Because Jesus Christ led in love. 
we read Philippians 2 together, that's what it looks like to lead. That's also what it looks like to submit, though, because Christ had to submit to the Father and his will. Same Christ, different instructions for us all. It's the same example. Jesus Christ is the answer uh, for us in all of these things. There's a book, and I'll just uh, leave this with you. It's called uh, Love and Respect. Anyone ever heard it? By a guy named uh, Emerson Egrich. Treasure trove for you. If you're looking for the 102 course in marriage, we've used it at our church before. We we tap into it in other different places. Uh, This is an amazing resource for you to tap into with marriage. I'd love to share uh, more with you about all of this, but I'll, I'll close you with this. <clears throat> when we were in Bible school, we had, uh, at one point, we had a bunch of different classes going on, and there was a women in ministry class going on that the, uh, uh, Mrs. Linda Bedore was teaching, and all, all the ladies were, were taking it, and, and I, I, I was in a class, I think I was downstairs, something like that, and all of a sudden, we heard raucous laughter. It would not stop. It was so loud. And I mean, we actually had to pause class multiple times. What is going on? It was like hyenas or chickens doing something. Just as We knew it was the girl class. We knew that's not what was going on. I couldn't, I couldn't wait to find out what was happening. And later on, my wife had shared with me that Mrs. Bedore had asked for scripture references about godly biblical womanhood and marriage. Well, intending to reference 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, it says, In like manner also, that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. That's a good verse for, for women. Somebody had accidentally cited the wrong verse. They had quoted 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10, which states, Therefore I endure all things for the sake of of the elect. (laughs) True story, right? (laughs) I close you, I I just close with the thought that women, it is hard to submit when your husband isn't leading. Guys, it's really hard to lead when you're getting pushback from your wife and she's not submitting. But ladies, God gave you your instructions. He said, you know what you do? You follow, you submit as unto Christ. Guys, it doesn't matter what your wife is doing. It doesn't matter. You lead as Christ loved the church. You love her. No matter what she does, you love her. It doesn't matter. These are your instructions. These are your instructions. Even when it's hard, does it change your instructions? Hmm. When we rightly divide, we're finding our own mail, right? We talk about that illustration. We gotta read our own mail. We're not gonna read things that don't apply to us. I'm gonna leave you with the nugget. Let's rightly divide our instructions when it comes to marriage. Guys, don't read instructions that don't believe, belong to you. Don't read and say, but Lord, she's not doing what she's, do- what she's supposed to do. Didn't Adam do that? That woman you gave to me. Follow your mail. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for your instructions. Thank you for giving us a map. Thank you that you've given us the opportunity and the privilege to live out the gospel through our marriage and the relationship of you to, your, to the church, Father. We thank you for these things. Help our marriages. Uh, Father, we pray for those who need comfort this morning. Comfort us, equip us, transform us, Father. In Christ's name we pray, amen.